Good morning, everyone. Oh, yes, hello. Are you? Can you hear me now? <laughs> we want to thank every, each and every one of you for being here this morning. Um, a beautiful, nice, cold end to winter here. We uh, do have a few announcements to cover. The first one is um, comes from Joanne. Uh, especially, but from all of us uh, to tell you how much we appreciate how you supported the soup dinner last night. We had lots of help. We had lots of pies and we made lots of money. And, uh, the, uh, we made over $900 last night, which is remarkable for the weather the way it was and, and just all the ball games and everything were going on. So I think we can really, uh, praise the Lord for the success of this event and we want to praise you too for, for helping in all the many ways that you did. Also, we have had a report that Marvin Grooms is in the hospital. And um, I think that's enough details for right now, other than just to remember him in your prayers, that he's been such an important part of our congregation for many years. And uh, just uh, to pray for him. And um, I, he knows we love him. Are there any? I think that the pastor does have something he wants to bring up this morning. Sure. Uh Following worship right after uh, here at 11-ish, would sure like everybody to go downstairs and hang out for a bit. Uh, Vicki Sprunger, who we've hired as our Director of Children's Ministry, is going to be uh, downstairs. She's going to share a little bit about uh, what she's thinking about what we can be doing with all these little kids that are down front here. So <laughs> she's got some uh, some ideas and some vision about uh, some things that we could be doing. And so she's invited us all to come downstairs and Talk about it. Taco about it. So we have ta- fixings for tacos and walking tacos and taco salads. And there's probably leftover soup and sandwiches down there. So um, even if you have no children, grandchildren, come down. Uh, just come down as a church family and let's, uh, let's hear about this uh, and support Vicki and, and the rest of the people that are involved in children's ministry. Kind of, let, let's kind of see what God's doing here with that. Let's look forward to it. So right after worship, uh, we'll head downstairs. Thanks. Thank you. And I do believe we do have some uh, leftover soup and sandwiches, too, that that um, you're welcome to also. We'll have a donation pot in the basement for those things. But again, thank you, everyone, for supporting that. Is there anything else that I've forgotten this morning? Anything we need to bring up? If not, let's quiet our hearts as we move on in our service this morning. Good morning. Luke 5, 4 through 11. When he finished teaching, he said to Simon, push out into deep water and let your nets out for a catch. Simon said, master, we've been fishing hard all night and haven't even caught a minnow. But if you say so, I'll let out the nets. It was no sooner said than done, a huge haul of fish straining the nets past capacity. Simon Peter, when he saw it, fell to his knees before Jesus. Master, leave. I'm a sinner and can't handle the holiness. Leave me to myself. Jesus said to Simon, there is nothing to fear. From now on, you'll be fishing for men and women. They pulled their boats up on the beach, left them, nets and all, and followed him. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that there was a net once cast that caught us. We praise you that you have brought us in to you. We confess we too often have fallen short of your goodness, yet we are yours. We pray that you would teach us to be good fishers of men and women. May your spirit empower this church to attract others to you and the good news of your son. We pray you would be pleased of our worship of you this hour. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please stand and sing, shout to the Lord. See each one of you this morning. So glad you're all here. And my goodness, it's been cold outside, hasn't it? It's been really something. Now, I'm going to ask you a question this morning, and this is the question. I'm just going to take a vote, okay? Since spring is coming tomorrow, we're going to talk about the seasons. Now then, uh, I'm going to ask you which season you like the best, and you hold up your hand when I get to the one you like the best. There's summer, fall, winter, and spring, so you be thinking which one you like the best. How many like summer the best? Yeah, that's a pretty good one, isn't it? How many of you like fall the best? Oh, that's a pretty one. That's hard to beat, isn't it? 
How about winter? <laughs> Nobody likes winter. How old are you? <laughs> yeah, winter is pretty cool too. They're, oh, pretty cool. It is a, a, a good one too, isn't it? And how about spring? Yes, I think so too. You know, you all have good ideas about which which uh, season you like the best. But you know what's really neat is that God made all these different seasons for us just for us to enjoy his world. In the summer, we get to, like, the ones that like summer, I bet it's because you can go swimming. You can chase fireflies. And there's always picnics with watermelon and wonderful things to do. And the ones that like fall, I thought of you because I kind of like fall too. And it gets cozy and you got pumpkins and falling leaves and beautiful beautiful things to see. And Halloween's even kind of fun too, isn't it? And then there's winter with the snow that comes down and makes us feel cozy. And did you notice last week when it snowed how beautiful it was? All the trees were covered. Just made God's earth look beautiful and we know we have nice warm cozy houses to be in and parents that take care of us and love us and how safe we feel inside and now we're looking at spring starting tomorrow with beautiful blooms and blossoms that come out with flowers and we start to see the start of apples and maybe some fresh lettuce from the garden and again God's world just comes alive and I think it's a neat time you know we're getting ready for Easter To have it in the spring because it's when all the earth comes back alive again with flowers and green grass and great hopes for what the whole summer is going to be like too. And that's like loving Jesus and celebrating Easter where we know that loving Jesus and trusting him makes our life better and we can look ahead to all the beautiful things that God has made for us. So this week when you're out driving around and all of a sudden you see some little flowers budding and some green grass coming, think of Jesus too and his love and the love God had for us when he made this beautiful earth. Okay? I do have a treat for you, but let's have a prayer first. Dear God, we thank you so much for this beautiful earth you gave us and how much you had to be thinking about us for each one of the special gifts the earth gives us through you. Help us to remember that every day that you love us and that showing your love through the beauty you've made here on earth. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And as the kids get their treats, if you want to stop and stand and say hello to each other. Did you notice the background that I used for the text there? Did you, did you catch that? Because you know every time we sing that song, i got to talk about the window, don't I? You know, because that's what this window was designed after that. Nothing in my hand I cling, simply to the cross I cling. You know, that, you remember how that is? That's, what the, that's, that's the preface for that, that painting that's on that wall. And so we used that for the, for the backdrop there. Yeah, we sing of Christ and we refer to him as our... As a rock, our, our rock of ages, and the, him before that, Christ, our solid rock, we sang there, there as well. It's, it's who he is. It's one way that we begin to understand him, understand who, who he was and what he means to us. You know, another aspect of who Christ was was a teacher. He's a solid rock, no doubt. He's the rock of all ages, but you know we know too that he was. He came and he taught, and 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 he instructed so many of those first people about himself and about kingdom kinds of, of things. And oftentimes his mode of teaching was through parables, and and he and he used these these parables where just they're, they're simple stories about about natural and familiar things that his hearers, his listeners, would have gotten. They, they, would, have understand, uh, they would have understood that, that part of their, uh, of their story. But then that familiar thing then was, to, it was done for the purpose of illustrating something of much uh, deeper value, something of the spiritual nature that was way, way deeper than just what was on, what was on the surface. And so many times those parables that he used to teach, uh, he used to help describe the kingdom of God. 
He, he came to usher in this, 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 new, this new kingdom, which, and he uses these parables probably because it's so indescribable for humans to be able to understand with the words that we have. And so oftentimes he would use, he would use these parables, and, and I'll go through several of them here that you're going to know them, but he would talk about the kingdom of God, and parables usually work this way. You know, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is like and he uses, he uses that word, like, a lot. And then he goes on to say, you know, it, it's like someone who sowed good seed in a field. Remember that parable? The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed that someone came and sowed in a field. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with her flour. Another one, the kingdom of heaven is, is like a treasure that was hidden in a field. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant who was in search for, pool, for pearls. The kingdom can be compared to a king who wished to settle his accounts with his slaves. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning and, and hired laborers to do his work in his vineyard. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like ten bridesmaids who went out and took their lamps to meet the bridegroom. And in each of those cases, that was the beginning of how he would start the teaching. The kingdom of heaven is, is like this. And then he would go on and he'd keep the familiar aspects of each of those pieces. And it would help people get to understand a little bit more about what he was saying this kingdom was like. It wasn't straight up. It wasn't just straightforward reference manual kind of teaching. Uh, because it's a difficult thing. It's a, it's again. It's a to talk about God's kingdom is beyond our language and beyond our understanding. But to get us to grasp, to get his first followers to to begin to embrace a little bit about this kingdom that he's bringing in, he did it in that form. He did it through parables. And I would have been one of those smart aleck disciples there too. Why do you always talk like that? You know, that would have been me. And that's exactly what the disciples did. You know, why why is it that you teach? In parables all the time. And, and Jesus said that to answer their question. Why is, why is that your t- teaching method? And, and he says this, I do that so to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. But to others it hasn't been given. So there is a hiddenness about this kingdom that would only be uh, received or understood or heard from those that were, that, that were chosen, that would get it. And those that wouldn't get it would, would, would not get it because of, their, because of their, their, their refusal to recognize who he was. Several of us are, are going through the TV series called uh, the, the Chosen. And it's in this week's episode that, that Jesus shares a, a, a parable in the, in the movie, the TV show. He recites a parable with his, with his followers. And when I watched it the first time, uh, I, I, that kind of sounds good. You know, it kind of sounds like that's that's the right teaching. But you know, the more I listen to it, I'm like, I don't I don't remember if that's if that's right or not. Because and I think I shared this with you before. You know, what they've done in this TV show is there's so much about the chosen, his followers that we just don't know. You know, it wasn't recorded. I mean, we don't know much about Matthew. We don't know much about Thaddeus. We don't know. There's just not much there. And so, to help better understand. Uh, th- this beginning of the church and what those disciples would have been like, these, these modern-day directors and writers of The Chosen, they're, they're kind of making up some of the backstories uh, to sort of give us uh, you know, a little bit about what it would have been like for those people. And so they've taken some, some creative liberties on how they're putting this together. Oh, maybe, maybe this teaching, it kind of sort of sounds like something Jesus, J- Jesus would do, but you know, maybe, that's what they were, maybe that's what they were doing here. We just, you know, we don't know. We don't know that. And so this, this parable that's here, this teaching, it was kind of an effective uh, element in, in the show. Uh, Jesus is, is, is teaching his, his disciples, his followers at, at the time, those that have kind of rounded up and are interested in his, in his teaching. And the way they did this in the show, it kind of neatly fits into uh, one, of the, one of the stories that, that we know, that Carissa just read about, that story of where, where Simon's out on the boat and Jesus said, said, uh, hey, you know, uh, cast your nets. And, and you know what happened. The miraculous catch was there. So this, is, this scene is, is, is about there. It's, uh, it's right around that. You know the rest of this. Peter, Peter says, hey, you know, I've been fishing all night. I haven't caught anything, you know. And, and then when he, when he realizes what had happened, 
you know, he comes forward and he, real, he recognizes the power of Christ. He recognizes that he is the Messiah. And, he, and just what she read, he sees himself in the perfect light of Christ and he just shudders and says, you know, away from me, I'm a, I'm a sinful man. man. And so that's Peter's, according to Scripture, his, his first encounter of Christ. And, and again, what Carissa read there, he said, hey, you know, fish basically are nothing. He said, I want you to be fishers of people. And we know that. So, you know, we, I will make you right fishers of men. We know that story. It's a biblical story. And that, no doubt, is, is true. And we, and we have that here. But this, again, this parable that I'm sharing with you here, this was done before that scene took place. Now, you know, was that, was that really there? It caused, it caused me to, to wonder. So what you're going to see here, this is in the show, this is what happens right before that, that miraculous catch. And this is the teaching that he had for his followers. Because I'm on this boat, my final parable should be about fishing, yes? Simon, please send me that net. When this net is thrown into the sea, what happens, Simon? Well, I mean most of the time. It gathers. A a little louder. It gathers fish. Yes. This net gathers fish. All kinds of fish. Yes? Yes. All kinds of fish. And the kingdom of heaven... It's like, what happens next? After the net is full, Simon and the others draw it to the shore, sit down, and sort out the fish. The good fish go into the barrels, and the bad fish thrown away. So it will be at the end of the age. Angels will come and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into a fiery furnace. Do you understand? Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven, like you all are now, is like the master of a house who brings forth his treasures, both new and old. You are to do the same with this knowledge. These parables I tell Makes sense to some, not to others. Be patient. So you know when I when I watch that, you know there's there's things in there that you know I kind of like. It kind of sounds like you know a lot of what I've heard. You know we got we got nets and we got fish and we've got catching and we've got separating. And there's a kingdom. There's an end of the age. And, and he's using words like scribes and 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 uh, treasures and those kinds of things. But you know, is that is that in the Bible? And I, honestly, I, I don't. I didn't quite. I didn't remember that. And I thought, well, maybe that's just. I mean, maybe they just kind of put together some of their some of the teachings that he's done and kind of assembled something something like that. You know, I wonder was that a was that as you saw that was that very familiar to to you? Is that one that you would recall? That, yeah, I know that's. I know that's in scripture. It's, it's one of those. I don't know. And I didn't know. And I think that's. Uh, I wanted to know if it was really in there, so it forced me to kind of go back and, and consider the passage and find out, you know, if it was if it was really there. And you know, the fact of the matter is, it is. It, it is in the scripture. That, for for the most part, is verbatim to what Jesus had, had taught. And so that, you know, because I had to go back in there and do that, it was forced me to to go back in and think a little more deeply about that that passage. And found in that process, there's just such richness to that short passage that he had there that I just simply hadn't seen before. And I think that's a good thing. I think that's one of the nice things about what, what and that's what a lot of people are saying about this, this brand new TV show. It's kind of forcing us to kind of go back and find out what is true. And then in that, in that process, you know, we're just coming up with these rich treasures that we find that are in scripture. So yeah, if you look at that passage, it comes from the 13th chapter of, of Matthew. I'll read it again because the dialect's a little hard to, Hard to pick up sometimes. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven. Here we go again. Here's this parable. Is like. He's going to compare it to a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come 
out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them back into the furnace of fire or, or throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? He asked the disciples. They answered yes. I believe scripture. I believe it's true. I believe it's in here. I don't know that I believe their answer. Because I've got to be honest with you. I've been, I was a teacher, and, and you know, he, he handed them these tricky parables, you know. And, and you, I don't know if you get them right away. And they're, they're your typical students. You know this. You know, yeah, you guys getting this? You know, if I'm teaching a trig class or a calculus class, you getting this? And everybody, you know, they just want out. You know, I kind of think that's what it is here. Because some of these, they're, they're deep. And they take some time to process and get. And, you know, they answered yes. I, I don't know. We'll, we'll find out. But he goes on and he says this, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out the tre- his treasures, what is new and what is old. And so in that, as I went back and, and looked at that, you know, I'll confess to you, I don't, I, don't, I don't remember this so much. Maybe the first part of that, yeah, I don't know, I would have read it before, but you know, I kind of had to go back and say, yeah, that is, that is there. And I think there is such a... There's, there's such value in this for us to look at. And that's what I want to spend the rest of the time here is coming to know Christ through this teaching. Coming to know a little more about his kingdom based on what he's showing us in this, in this parable here. And, and I think, you know, maybe, uh, maybe the more confusing part might be the last part of that. Uh, maybe we'll, maybe we'll start there. Verse 52 is that every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a household who brings out his treasure, what is new and what is old. Now that one, if you think about that, as, I, as you go through this, you've read scripture before. And if I'd ask you, you know, when Jesus talked about scribes, typically was that a positive thing or a negative thing? It's usually negative, isn't it? You know, he'd talk about this, you know, the scribes and the Pharisees will tell you this thing. The scribes and the whoever will tell you this. Because they were religious leaders at the time. They were, they were there and we know that religious leadership during the time of Christ was, was kind of messed up. And, and, he, and part of the reason that he came back was to get some of this, some of this straightened out. But here we see scribes used positively. And this passage is only found in the book of, of Matthew. It's not, it's not paralleled in any of the other gospel. The, the scribes probably are a, more like a, a, a lawyer. Their, their job during the time was to maintain law. You know, they would probably do some writing of the law and copying of the law. But more than that, they're, they're interpreting what they believe the law to say and how that applies to, to life. And maybe Matthew identified a, a little bit more with that. Matthew was a tax collector, and so he would have been a guy that would have been keeping a lot of records, ledgers, He'd have a spreadsheet if they would have had him back then, but they, you know, obviously they didn't. So he, that's how he probably would have thought. And so for him to include that in his gospel, maybe, maybe he, he resonated there uh, just a bit with that because it was something that he could identify with. But those scribes, probably what Jesus is at after here, he, he's talking about these people who have been trained for the kingdom of heaven. Well, who, who would that be? If he's the teacher, it's going to be his followers. Those followers have been given this awesome responsibility to know, to maintain, and to proclaim this new law. This new law that he's ushering in here. And so they are these people that have this, this awesome responsibility to be the proclaimers and the keepers of the new law. And then he said, those people are going to be like the master of a household who brings out these treasures, old treasures and new treasures. And, you know, that's kind of, what do we, what's that all about there? And, I, and, you know, what he's getting at there, these treasures are truth. These new scribes, these people are to be the bearers and proclaimers of truth. And there's old truth. It would be the truth that these people would have known for so long in the scriptures that they had at the time, which is our Old Testament. There's treasure and there's value in that which you have had in your scriptures. That's, that is the value. But that which is new is Christ. He is the new treasure that is, that is here and now. So this that they are in possession of, these new scribes, the treasure that they have, is that of the goodness of that which is 
of the Old Testament that we have, but then this newness of, of Christ who is coming. One of the commentaries that I use uh, said this about that passage. It says, the message of the kingdom of heaven does not wipe the slate clean regarding the Old Testament. It doesn't wipe that out. But rather, it brings fulfillment to what has gone before, as Jesus has been at pains to demonstrate throughout this book. The old is not to be abolished, but to be judiciously integrated with the new perspective of the kingdom of heaven. And so that's what he's saying. You know, these, you people, you, you new scribes, you have that from which is old that has been fulfilled in the newness of Christ. That is, that's the treasure that you have. You are the people that have been taught by me, he's, he's saying. You are the ones that are trained in the kingdom. That's who those people would have been. The recipients of that teaching would have been the scribes that he's referring to. And they are the ones that would be the treasure keepers of what's old and what's new. But I think this becomes personal for us as well, because isn't that you and you and I as well? Don't we claim to be his followers? Haven't we been brought up and taught in his teaching that we have received through scripture as well? So I think there's personal application for this. That passage is speaking to us. Those scribes that he's referring there, I think, can be attributed to us because we've been trained up in the kingdom, exactly what that passage is saying. We, too, have in possession of this awesome treasure that we have, that which is old, this story that we have, this ancient, ancient story that started so long in creation is part of the old treasure that we have. That story that goes on that we have that relates to God's love for humanity as we see how he worked through the people of the Old Testament. That old treasure that we have is the continuation of that story and how he yearns to be a part of humanity's life by selecting kind of a nobody group of people to be a representative of him for all of humanity. He picked Abraham and we have that story that is part of our old treasure that we have and how he related to Abraham and his sons and his 12 grandsons to form this nation of people that were to live obedient to him in such a way that he would relate to them and then relate to the rest of the world as they saw how he related with them. That is, that is this good treasure that is old that we to possess. We've come to know him again through the preservation of that story and the word that we have in scripture. And that part of the story comes to an ultimate climax when Christ comes. God relates to his people, comes to this awesome finish here when he comes to fulfill what he intended to do throughout the Old Testament. When Christ came and fulfilled All of what the law required, all of what God was trying to do through these people at the time, and he did it by substituting himself for the penalty of all of humanity's sins on that cross. That power, that love that was demonstrated on a Good Friday that we will celebrate soon in a few weeks, that was validated on the first Easter morning when all of death was overcome by the resurrection power of the Son. That's the old treasure that you and I possess. That's part of this story that we have. We are part of that story. But we're also part of that new uh, treasure as well. Because we are people of this continuation of this story as it's lived out in faith in Christ and what he has done for us. That is the new treasure that he has established Himself once again with us. Paul wrote this in Second Corinthians, which I think speaks so great to this this new treasure idea. He says that if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to Himself through Christ. And it's given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. This 
this treasure that we have, part of that is this, this message of reconciliation that we are to bring out. These treasures we are to bring out and share with people. That's this new treasure that we have, this new creation that has taken place. And there's, there's that new word again. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. I remember when I was taking a, a class and the professor was talking about this passage. He said, you know, our English language really, really can't grasp what the original language, languages were saying there. And, and, and what, he was, what he was saying is it's, it's almost better to say if anyone is in Christ, new creation. He took out the words there is or you are. It's just there's this new creation that takes, that takes place. He's saying that when someone entrusts their, their lives to him and they clothe themselves in him, there is this, this new creation that takes place and God's creativity continues. And I believe what that means for us, the more I kind of understood and thought about what he was, what he was saying there, I think what that new creation is, to be bearers of this new treasure that we read about, that gets worked out as you and I, individually, and then collectively as we come together in our groups, how we uniquely then live out our lives that's in Christ. This new creation really becomes so different and unique because it depends upon who we are, where we are, what our circumstances are, when we were born, what resources we have, what talents and gifts we have. That all, that all comes into factor here that the expression of this new creation is unique and it's different because he made each of us different. We have different interests and we have different passions. And as that is played out in our relationships, it's new and it's this new creation and it's something distinctive based on us individually. And the cool thing is God's creation then goes on. He's continually creating as his kingdom grows because you and I, we have this old treasure and this new treasure and creation then just lives out itself in new ways as that relationship develops and is expressed with others in our relationship with him. So that parable, the other part of that then, the net and the fish, angels, End of an age, fulfillment of a kingdom, scribes and those words that are there, old and new. I think it's for us. Because we have this opportunity, you and I, individually, us as a church, to respond uniquely to what it means then to be kingdom participants here. But for me, the power of this parable, actually the power of all parables, is it takes insight and it takes interpretation to see what does this mean? What is the intended meaning here? You know, Christ didn't explain all of his parables. Some of them he did. You know, here's this parable, and they stopped. You know, we need to get the meaning of that. And then he would explain what it, what it was. But many of the parables, they, they were not fully ex- explained, uh, at least recorded in, in our text that we have. And I think that is by design. I think that requires us, the hearers, you and I, the readers, to interpret what that teaching means and how does that apply? How does that truth apply to our time, to our life, to our situation in ways that would always bring him glory and allow ourselves to grow more deeply and then offer what is so valuable to others? And so all those elements, all those things about that, that passage, you know, I just don't think it's my job here and now to, well, this is how I interpret it. This is what I think this means. I don't think it's my job to give specific interpretations of how this might apply, but I think each element here, if you'll allow me to pose some questions for you to prayerfully consider, let's think about that parable of some common things of fish and nets and catches and separation. What does that mean and how does that relate to the way you are living out lives, your lives? How is it that you are expressing your faith in all you do based on what he is doing as he teaches his kingdom truths to us. How is it then that we are taking this awesome treasure that this says and allowing it to give it to those who are perhaps poor in spirit? So stop. Let's go back. That first passage starts out and he says again, the kingdom of heaven. And we pause right there because we need to acknowledge that there is a kingdom. 
And that's pretty important that we do that. There is something other than what you and I fully experience here. There is a kingdom that supersedes everything that we have here. And it's important that we realize that. It's important that it is here, it is now, but it's going to come in its fullness when he returns. And we're getting these glimpses and these pieces in into what it's, what it's like. And he spoke about it so often. You know, those passages that I told you, all those little parts of the parables I showed, that's just Matthew's account. He talked about the kingdom so much and so clearly it's a very important thing. So before you go on with this, you need to ask the question, are you living out your life like this is all there really is? Are you, or are you living your life as being true kingdom people that you know that this experience is important, no doubt, but it's like little league compared to the major leagues. There's so much more that there is to come. And are we living out our life that way? Are we really doing that? Are we really centering our life that we are participants in a kingdom that will be eternally realized when he returns? And there are many people that claim that that day is coming soon. And then we have this picture of a net that was thrown into the sea and caught every kind of fish. They drew it in, they sat on, they separated the good from the bad. And he said, that'll be how the end of the age is. The age is. The angels will come and they'll separate the evil from the righteous. And they'll take those that are righteous and put them in one place. And the evil they will put into that furnace where there's weeping and the gnashing of teeth. So again, not necessarily an interpretation, but some questions for you to ponder and prayerfully think about. Are you a fish that's been captured by that net? Have you been brought in? Have you been given the knowledge of God's kingdom? And when it comes time for the fish to be separated, when it comes time for the evil to be separated from the righteous, when the angels do that, where are you in that part of the story? That's a value of the parable, is how is it that I fit into the story? Are you a caster of the net? Like Simon, we, the church, part of what we are to do is is fish for people. That is our calling. We are to go and make disciples. You know that that's this great commission that we, that we are, we are to do. Are we fishers of people? We're called to go get them. We're called to go get them. And is that really what you and I are about individually? Is that what we're about as a church? Are we really casters of net out really to catch people in order that we can share the love of Christ with them? In order that they would be given an opportunity to hear the good news of Christ? Are we, are we, are, are we that? Net casters. That's what they do. They throw nets. They're out to get fish. They're to bring people in and give them the opportunity to connect with God in order that they can develop a relationship with the Son. That's kind of what we're supposed to do. What we're not supposed to do is judge or evaluate any kind of fish before we throw the net. Mm, But we do that sometimes, don't we? That's not our job. And the story, that's the... That's the job of the angel. The angels will be the one that that separate that. But unfortunately, sometimes we focus on making the separation before we cast the net. We can be judgmental. And that can come in a lot of different ways. And we need to think about that individually. We need to think about that collectively as a church. What is it we are to be doing here? What is our, our job? You know, when you throw a net, you'll catch all kinds of species of fish. You catch them all. In the movie, I didn't, I didn't share it there, but as they, as they did this, Jesus told the fishermen, catch the fish. I'll sort them out later. And it was kind of a neat way to think about that. They'll be sorted out later. That's not our job. We're not supposed to look around and try to find the right species of fish. We're not supposed to look around and try to find the exact kind of person that would be a perfect fit at, at our church. We're to go get them. He'll sort them out later. How's your casting? How we do in there? Every scribe, he finishes up, who's been trained in the kingdom of heaven is like this master who's got treasure to bring out that's both new and old. 
scribes that have been trained in the kingdom, and again, I think that's us. How is your training going? Where do you fit in that? How well do you know this story? How well are you, or how much are you embracing this story, this treasure that we have? And how well, how good are you doing of bringing that treasure out for others to hear and to see and respond? Are we really about being the best masters of the household that that passage says and bringing this tremendous treasure out to Christ and to others? Or are there things that are holding us back? Are we not bringing them out because we're so hung up on traditions or rituals or things we just simply do because that's the way we've always done it in church that really is not any part of that old treasure or new treasure. It's just the way we've done things. Are any of that stuff keeping us from allowing this new treasure, this new creation to be expressed in our lives or in our church's lives as well? What's keeping us from being the best fishers of others? What's keeping this church from casting nets that will just be stretched so tightly because people are growing here inside the church and other people are coming? That wasn't many answers, was it? It was a whole bunch of questions, and that's the purpose. That's the purpose, to take this teaching and to put it back on each of us. What is it that this is speaking to us? He said, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to others it's not been given. And it's our job then to respond appropriately and be like him. Let's stand and we'll close with prayer. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for just the life of your word. That Stories that we would have read maybe since we were children, but when we open ourselves up to the Spirit's power to allow that to become new life and new energy, we just pray that your word would penetrate our hearts and change us. Help us to be the people that you would be through our knowledge of you and through our understanding of your word. We give you all the praise and all the glory, and it's in Christ. Amen.